Well, welcome to the Society of Critical Care Medicine's Project Dispatch webcast, Electronic Distraction in the ICU, an Impediment to Patient Safety. This session is part of the unique webcast series, Patient Safety During Bedside Procedures in the ICU. My name is Roy Constantine. I am the co-chair of the Patient Safety Committee, the Society of Critical Care Medicine Surgery Section, and secretary of the Council for Surgical and Perioperative Safety. I am also the assistant director of mid-level practitioners at St. Francis Hospital, the Heart Center in Roslyn, New York. I have no relevant disclosures. Today's webcast is supported by a grant from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. The content is solely the responsibility of the presenters and does not necessarily represent the official views of AHRQ. This webcast will include approximately 40 minutes of content. Due to the short nature of this educational activity, there will not be CE or CME offered. You are invited to ask questions for our presenter throughout the webcast. You may do so by typing your questions into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel. Questions will be addressed after the presentation. You will also have the opportunity to participate in several interactive polls. When you see a poll, simply click the bubble next to your choice. This webcast will be available at www.sccm.org backslash project dispatch or on Society of Critical Care Medicine's YouTube channel within three business days. We invite you to share this and the many other project dispatch webcasts and patient stories with your colleagues widely. Post on Facebook if you like this webcast and if you tweet, tweet on using hashtag project dispatch during this webcast to spread the word. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Dr. P.J. Papadakis is the director of the Division of Critical Care Medicine, a professor of anesthesiology, surgery, and neurosurgery at the University of Rochester. He has edited five textbooks in the field of critical care medicine and authored over 120 chapters and articles in the fields of critical care medicine of the surgical and trauma patient. Dr. Peter, Dr. Papadakis is an internationally recognized expert in critical care medicine with active research interests in acute respiratory distress syndrome, neurocritical care, trauma management, and mechanical ventilation. He serves as an advisor in patient safety for the AORN. In 2011, he began noticing troubling problems regarding trauma patients injured while texting and they related this findings to the behavior of health workers on their personal electronic devices while at work. He then noted that this is a widespread problem with health professionals throughout the world. His observations and work in this aspect of patient safety were featured in the New York Times by award-winning correspondent Matt Rictel with the term Distracted Doctors was coined. This article started a media firestorm that has begun to be addressed by medical centers and professional societies worldwide. Dr. Papadakis has no relevant disclosures. Now I will turn the program over to Dr. Papadakis. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you again. This is uh, Dr. Papadakos. I'm with the University of Rochester uh, Medical Center at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. And hopefully by the end of this program, we'll go over our learning ob objectives, assessing the levels of noise and distraction in the ICU. And also we're going to learn a little bit about articulating and developing protocols on how to prevent the spread of infection via electronic devices, which is also a uh, pertinent problem. Uh, the lecture, as uh, Dr. Constantine mentioned, was developed after I uh, began reading a series of articles by Pulitzer Prize winner uh, Matt Richtel in the New York Times on electronic distraction. Uh, 
of drivers. And uh, since I do uh, the majority of my work in trauma, I, I, I had seen a big uptick in my patient population of texting and driving accidents. But then I started looking around my ICU and I began observing that healthcare workers throughout North America and Europe, uh, and, I, and I thought this was a troubling trend in terms of patient focus. Uh, in November 2011, I uh, wrote an editorial, uh, and we'll go over it a little bit because just think back to your ICU, wherever you work, that the supervising attending comes onto the ward, passing the unit secretary who's texting on her smartphone. She then passes the nurse who's surfing on the web. She then stops to watch the resident who is gaming on his table. Well, as farcical as this might seem, this digital nightmare is occurring in hospitals throughout the country and the world. And unfortunately, we have almost no data on how electronic distraction affects worker productivity and dedication to the repetitive tasks in healthcare. Only now are we beginning to, 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 study, to, to study this. Well, the fixation on electronic devices has, has changed society. I think we can all uh, testify to that, uh, you know, spend any time around a dinner table at a family gathering. But it may impact greatly on professionalism and safety in the complex environment of our ICU. Remember, the ICU, just like the operating room, it's a very complex environment. And things are going to get worse before they get better because as younger staff are joining the workplace, they've grown up in a connected world. They're, they're connected to their Facebook, their Snapchat. Verbal has shifted to visual communication. As you probably all know, people text a lot more than they speak on their phones. Uh, and these devices have become extensions of, of themselves. Uh, when polled, many young people say they cannot live without their phone or uh, device. And our focus in terms of gathering information has become on bits of information versus large narratives. So, you know, we've had a paradigm shift. And I think this can all be illustrated by this. Uh, Eric uh, Pickersgill uh, is a uh, prominent photographer. And if you look at this slide, you can see how farcical everybody looks when you take their phones away. But you can understand, if you look around your ICU, you look around your hospital, you look around any shopping mall, this is the way people are, uh, even at the dinner table. The demographic data clearly supports that 92% of teens report going online daily, including 24% who state they are going online constantly. Social media dominates their lives. And I think we've all seen that in news stories uh, about how social media dominates lives, how organizations uh, use social media, how political debates live on Twitter, and media people live on Twitter and hashtags. Uh, the distracting uh, driving data is horrendous. More than uh, nine people are killed and more than 1,153 injured daily in crashes where distraction plays a role. This is definitely impacting on, on, on society. Social media use uh, is widespread. You can see from this slide, Facebook dominates the market, but uh, other, other uh, social media networking uh, things like Instagram, Twitter, and Lycan are up there. And it definitely affects focus. And I, I use this illustration from a, a New York City subway that there was a shooting on a New York City subway and no one noticed the shooter or noticed that there was a, sh a shooting going on because they were all on their phones uh, fixated on their telephones. And quite honestly, data from automobile accidents clearly shows that when involved in an accident and someone is asked who is texting, they don't remember the accident, but they remember the text. 
We've had distracted walking, as I pointed out earlier in the talk, uh, one of the number one ways to be struck by an, a motor vehicle on a college campus in a major city is distracted walkers. And why is there an addiction to these electronic devices? You know, I think this is a very um, interesting uh, topic. And, and we talk about this rise of electronic uh, distraction in healthcare, as we pointed out, where we have to have staff that is focused on patient care. And is addiction playing a role? So we go to poll question number one. Have you ever felt the need to cut down on the use of your electronic device? Please answer that question. Okay, so 71% said yes. All right, let's go to the next slide. Have you, all right, have people annoyed you by criticizing your use of your electronic device? Again, answer truthfully. Okay, well, a lot of people said no, but 37% of you said yes. Have you ever felt guilty about your electronic device use? Okay, 55% of you said yes, 45 no. And we're going to go to the final question. Do you reach for your electronic device as soon as you wake up, eye opener, and alarm does not count? You're not using it as your alarm clock. So first thing in the morning, do you get to your, you open up your smartphone, check on those emails from work or Facebook. All right. No. Well, if you if the if you answered yes to two out of the four questions, does anyone recognize what these questions are the modified questions of? Well, they're the the modified cage tool, which was a it's a, a highly supported and evaluated tool to look at alcoholism and drug addiction. So Basically, what we showed in this short thing is uh, our audience, uh, a, a good proportion of you are addicted uh, to your little box that you carry around. So that's, that's going to be a very important teaching point as we go on for this because self-awareness of an addiction, be it alcoholism or anything else, sometimes leads to positive behavioral modification. And the reason it's addictive is because of both uh, top-down, top-down being we focus on a task at hand, the screen, thus losing ourselves. That's, that's where the car accident occur. Common for distracted drivers never to remember the events of an accident, but the text is clearly recalled. Big problem for healthcare workers. Just think of your ICU team. If somebody is looking at a Facebook or is texting, they're not hearing the patient care rounds. They're not hearing that critical laboratory. They're not hearing that critical ventilatory setting. They're not hearing that clinical positive diagnostic test. And bottom up is the reason we reach for our gizmos, is that Bing or Q draws our attention and we mostly answer or look at the screen forgetting the task at hand. There's a well-described example of a resident who was writing an order, got the ping, it went to Facebook because it was an automatic pop-up, it had to do with a party, that individual didn't write to stop the anticoagulant, the patient went down for a, a diagnostic test and had a, a major bleeding event. That is the bottom-up uh, stimulation, that, that pop-up on your screen for an email or whatever that draws you to the email. 
evolutionarily, this is a key survival task because as primates, you know, a rustling leaves, uh, since we were uh, usually the game and not the predator, meant an important thing. Is there a problem in healthcare because of these devices? And next few slides, uh, and as you know, the ICU and operating rooms have become computer-rich environments between electronic medical records, the ability to bring up uh, information in terms of labs and images. Uh, but our healthcare organizations uh, have figured out that uh, in terms of healthcare technology hazards uh, in 2013, that caregiver distraction from smart phone and other mobile device was a major in the top 10 of technology hazards in hospitals. And the media coverage in terms of healthcare workers being distracted has exploded. And, and the, let's, let's go over the data and, you know, this is a nice farcical picture and, you know, the patient is obviously concerned, their doctor is fixated on the phone, but we've heard media reports of uh, such events occurring. So in 2011, there was a uh, an abstract that was presented at the American Society of Anesthesiology meeting uh, out of Vanderbilt, and the group showed that residents and CRNAs who were told that they were going to be filmed on, by closed circuit television and they were being absor uh, observed, 54% uh, of them still used the computer on the machine to surf the net when they were follow-up question answered, I asked, why were you doing that even though you were told we were observing you and this is a negative thing? They said, because I have to. And again, supporting that kind of an addiction to the electronic device, I have to. That's a very, very troubling response. When, when uh, a while ago, our group did uh, impact on electronic distraction in the operating room, a survey. We surveyed the American Association of, of Clinical Directors, and we saw that there is a uh, reports of electronic distraction in the operating room. Physicians, OR personnel, both. Uh, quite a lot of people who are distracted in the operating room where there is a culture of safety that has been around for a number of years. The focus, the, the handoffs, everything else is very formalized in the operating room. So even in the operating room where a lot of this is, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, taught about vigilance, uh, there were uh, problems. Um, and the other scary thing is uh, when we looked at clinical directors, uh, no program no education about electronic distraction uh, in 74.11% of the cases. Again, a very scary thing that we know there's a problem. So then we go to a study that was published in Perfusion, and this is our cardiopulmonary bypass colleagues, uh, did a uh, survey of their entire membership. A and this, this slide is very interesting because when we look at table number one, we, we realize that percent of respondents by age who believe it is unsafe to operate a heart-lung machine when speaking on the phone, texting, surfing the internet, and then you look at table number two. Even though people think it's dangerous, they're still doing it. A very scary fact. All right, how about our environment? Let's go into an, uh, a pediatric intensive care unit. And this, this study done at Jacoby Medical Center of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York is very interesting. They observed people on rounds, the attendings and the residents on rounds in a pediatric intensive care unit. How often are smartphones being used during inpatient attending rounds? Look at this, the residents, who is the smartphone user, self-report 57% of them are on 
phone ignoring rounds. And with the uh, faculty observer observing them, it's up to 73%. Uh, you know, and on table number two, reading personal texts, 37%, 55%. This is during rounds. This is during bedside rounds in a pediatric intensive care unit. Uh, hey, okay. So how do how do we address the problem? Well, I think three clear bullet points: education, behavior modification, and guidelines. I think all of us who work in the intensive care unit have to begin by educating people. Be Modifying our own behavior and helping to develop unit-based guidelines or hospital-wide guidelines for the use of these devices that are going to take, will take, the attention away from patients. Well, think about how it looks to the patient. I am an intubated patient. I'm in the ICU, and suddenly I'm surrounded by people. This is a staged photograph from, from my team in the ICU faculty, my nurse practitioner and PA, but they're looking at the side of the bed and they see a bunch of computer screens. It gets even worse. Uh, we go into the patient room, everybody has a computer open uh, or is holding a tablet, and we're going to go over a little bit about why this, this should not be what happens into the intensive care unit. By the way, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the old guy in the, in the picture. Uh, and then other times we're, we're talking at, to a patient and we're looking at a computer screen and making no eye contact at all. Uh, all of these are very disheartening. And obviously it's a major aspect that we need to educate healthcare providers, medical students, nursing students, uh, orientees, respiratory therapists in electronic extraction. Uh, I'm very lucky. Uh, my university has backed us very much so here at the University of Rochester. and We have been a leader in the field of human to device relationships in tar terms of t teaching house staff and healthcare providers how to interact with electronic technology, which I think all of us all over the country in every field in healthcare should 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 talk about. We've actually developed a, a code of conduct policy which tells such things, and I'll, I'll give you a piece of information. On rounds, only two people, uh, uh, two to three people have computers on, uh, uh, one of which is the, uh, a resident who brings up images, the other person who's writing orders, and the farm D. Uh, the attending does not have an open computer because he is interacting with patients and family, and the other members are not uh, of the team, the medical students, the therapists, the other people who are part of the team don't have computers open, but are participating in rounds in real time and not looking about another patient or whatever. They are focused on that patient at that specific time, and we'd be happy to, uh, to deal. Various organizations, the Canadian Society of Respiratory Therapy actually has a nationwide guideline on professional behavior while interacting uh, with an electronic device. That information can be found on their web page. As you heard from my introduction, I've worked very closely with the uh, AORN, the Association of Perioperative Nurses, to develop uh, guidelines in terms of decreasing uh, 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 fixation on electronic devices in the operating room. And we talk about it becoming a uh, smartphone addiction has become a cultural uh, mode, so we're actively educating and developing programs at the annual meetings of the AORN to discuss this topic of patient safety. One of the other things uh, that we have uh, participated is actually develop, many of us in medical school, resident and fellow education, and education of healthcare allied health professionals, such as respiratory therapists, nurses, advanced practice practitioners, 
do simulation drills. And in doing some simulation drills, we add the temptation of actually texting the people who are uh, doing the drill to see if they uh, lose focus from the task at hand. And quite honestly, before training and secondary feedback, we've noticed that people will stop doing the patient care activity to fixate on uh, the, the ping or the, the uh, alert on their phone. Uh, so it's very important to add that outside uh, distractor when doing simulations uh, in, in educating your staff uh, throughout the hospital. And the other thing is this creation of the eye patient. Uh, you know, obviously with all the electronics we have available in the ICU, we lose touch of the real patient. The patient exists in the electronic medical records. And we should not have, computers should be our tools in terms of caring for patients. And computers should not be dehumanizing uh, medicine. So one of the things that we educate uh, young healthcare providers and you know older providers is actually when we go into a room with a computer or a tablet we actually introduce the computer or the tablet as a third patient person in the ICU room when we sit down with the family we say we're going to use this to show you some images or you know it's it, instead of the family thinking that it's something that we're taking uh, taking away from our focus. We're using the device as part of the healthcare team and we introduce the device, the computer or the portable device as a member of the healthcare team when we're actively using it in patient care as we're all mandated with the explosion of electronic medical records. And right here you see uh, a uh, pediatric uh, educator uh, going over uh, the pressure volume loops of a young asthmatic patient that was treated in the emergency room. Uh, going over that with mom uh, and the young person, so we're using, instead of the person just talking into their computer screen, they're actively using their uh, electronic device as part of patient education. Uh, and these are some basic guidelines uh, that we've developed over the years and they've been uh, picked up by many medical centers across North America, uh, Europe, and Asia, when in professional dress, try not to use your device in public, elevators, halls, etc. It's basic public relations, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Never use while in a patient room. Do not have out on your rounds. Don't put your patient data uh, uh, on an unprotected device. Uh, I'm not talking about hospital issued tablets or computers that are encrypted and protected. Obviously, silencing the messaging system, ringtones and alert. A, some of them are annoying. B, some of them are politically incorrect. They may break down patient uh, uh, caregiver relationships if they're inappropriate. If a family emergency arises, excuse yourself from the room, say, you know, I just got an emergency, please, I'll be right back. And when you have to do extensive uh, communicating with family, uh, use in a private place. Uh, you know, uh, uh, patients and fellow staff do not need, uh, need to hear your private matter. So let's go back to that first bullet point about professional dress. I have surveyed families. Uh, uh, in, in multiple settings in the hospital. And you have to understand, the majority of people use their smartphones to get out of work during their work day. So when they see us on the device, they think we're going to ignore a family member, them, and do exactly what they do at work use it as an escape from work. So that's kind of a key point. Because the general public who uses these devices to an extreme expects a different standard of healthcare professionals in multiple comments, the distracted doctoring articles in the media. They get upset seeing you on the same device that they use because they expect you to be focused on them. Since, remember, all of us should remember, since the dawn of history, in any cultural background, 
physicians and healthcare workers have always been held to a much different standard than the normal populace. One of the ways uh, we have, can develop proper etiquette is not allowing us to have our personal devices in hand. And in many hospitals, they have hospital-based or hospital-issued devices, which you're handed at the day. There is a closer system. It's, a, it's your hospital phone number. Uh, it is not your home number. And, but never modify it, never use it for private matters in view of patients or public. Go to an office or staff lounge during your work breaks. Do not have anything on the screen of the EMR imaging, uh, et cetera, in public areas so that computer in the hallway, you don't want somebody, you don't want to be accused of violating HIPAA. Explain to the patient and the public that the computer system is for patient cre uh, care and has greatly improved our ability to review tests, etc. images. So again, getting back to that point I brought up earlier in the conversation, which was using the computer device as a uh, extender of healthcare, as part of the healthcare team. And remember, everything you text and everything you email is not protected. I think if you look at this slide, uh, and this is uh, just a slide from uh, uh, stationary of a law firm, but this is almost every law firm in the United States because there is no privacy uh, of your uh, emails and texts. So lawyers never email uh, or text each other. They still talk to each other on the phone, which can only be uh, found out by court order. And to illustrate that, many of you may be aware of an anesthesiologist in Dallas who was accused of not paying attention to a patient who became hypoxic and then subsequently expired. And uh, these, these are courtesy of ABC News. I participated in the 2020. And this is the log that for $125, AT&T, uh, generated a log of every text sent that corresponded to the time in the operating room. So what I'm telling everyone is that this fixation on electronic devices has also become a tool to be used against a healthcare practitioner during a malpractice suit. So let's say an, an unstable patient uh, uh, gets disconnected from the ventilator and subsequently dies in the ICU. The lawyers in 2015 will subpoena the phone records of every healthcare worker involved in the care of the patient and clearly show to the jury that everybody was either texting, was on YouTube or Facebook, and that's why their client expired. You know, uh, it, it may sound scary, but it's happening now more and more often, not only in healthcare, but for accidents on the road, for industrial accidents. Uh, I think all of you are familiar with the train accident in Spain that killed uh, a number of people. They found out that the driver was texting, the train operator was texting because they generated his log. All right, we've talked about our addicted staff, but the electronic personal device that we all carry around is also a danger to our ICU in terms of generating nosocomial infections in our intensive care units and transmitting infections from patient to patient in the ICU environment. And I can tell you, and if you review the data, cell phones have been and computer screens have been implicated in it, uh, several ICUs as nidises have spread. Cultures from phones are positive for nosocomial pathogens. Phones are rarely disinfected by healthcare workers or families. And most places do not have any policies. There are no warning signs to families outside of 
uh, ICUs uh, saying that, you know, please use this disinfected wipe on your phone. Don't share your screen with the sick person. After the sick person uses a smartphone, you should disinfect it. We don't have that stuff, but it's, it, it's fairly clearly. And I can tell you, uh, it has also been implicated in Ebola. Uh, so by the World Health Organization as one of the ways Ebola was spread and may be the way Ebola was spread to healthcare workers because it, you go into the, uh, let's say the Ebola stricken room with your smart tablet, you care for the patient, share some information with the patient, you're touching the screen, you have your gloves, and you take everything off when you go off, you shower, but you never cleaned your smart screen on your computer. So computer hardware, especially keyboards in the rooms, can become contaminated with microorganisms, and you should have strict policies in terms. C. diff can survive on surfaces for as long as five months, and we all have uh, C. diff uh, epidemics in our intensive care units throughout the United States and throughout the world. And MRSA can survive days to month on even dry surfaces. Okay? So what is the, you should have a policy in place. You should use either, you know, wash your hands, obviously. No gloves should be used on computers. You should isolate the devices. Uh, personal cleaning of equipment can be sanitized with germicidal wipes. There are a number of them commercially available out there that will not damage the computer screen. Uh, and you can readily find them. Uh, there are a number of manufacturers of, uh, of them, and you should have a strict policy. And you should share those disinfected wipes with uh, patients and visitors. The other thing is those of us involved in the ICU, it's an outstanding opportunity in terms of educating the public about the dangers of distraction, especially distractive driving. It is, I, you know, I do trauma intensive care unit for the majority of my ICU practice, and I can tell you uh, just yesterday, two patients, both victims of texting and driving. They were not the drivers, they were the people hit on, head on by other people. Uh, you know, a bus load of uh, special needs people the week before uh, hit by a car that the, the driver was texting. We can get out there in terms of community education and our ICU trauma ICU team is going out to the schools talking to drivers ed classes uh, about this. Several organizations, critical care organizations are looking into community education. Hospitals are looking into community education because as you saw from the numbers that I presented early on, 9 to 11 people killed a day. 1,134 injured per day is massive numbers. We're talking about billions of dollars of health care costs. They're, 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 and in summary, let's go over things in summary. Turn off your devices in, in patient care areas. They don't need to hear your marimba music. Realize that you have a problem. Realize that your staff has a problem and begin educating each other. You know what? The pager is still a great way for your family to contact you in a family emergency. You know, I surveyed some of the nursing staff and it's amazing. People who have small children in daycare because of this pervasive texting are getting ridiculous texts that 10, 20 years ago, the, the, pers the worker, you know, Billy pooped, Billy drank, Billy had an orange. Like somebody needs to know that second to second. If you see a, a fellow worker who you think is uh, ignoring patient care in the ICU and is not focused on patient care, correct your fellow worker. When talking to patients, don't have your head in a, in a computer screen. Make eye contact with patients. Talk to the patient and then excuse yourself. Say something like, I'm going to examine you, we're going to talk, and then I'm going to enter the information into the computer so we can share it with the other healthcare team members. Develop unit-based protocols to, to prevent electronic distraction for your unique environment of your ICU. And you know, start open discussions with fellow professionals on this topic. And you know, just like that group at Jacoby, develop studies and collect data. This is an outstanding opportunity for, 
for ICUs, healthcare workers, to start thinking about very important studies that they can develop to, to promote patient safety in, in their environment, in our environment of critical care medicine. And remember, nothing in excess. You know, being Greek, I may sound like my big fat Greek wedding, but at the temple of Apollo at Delphi, one of the most important things the muses said was nothing in excess. And I think if we look around our society, our smartphone use has become excessive. You know, the expectation of answering emails from work in the middle of the night or on vacation or when you're traveling has pervaded our society. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to questions, comments, because I believe we have uh, the question and answer period now after this 40-minute lecture. Peter, thank you. Thank you. This was excellent. And I think that we have some very interesting questions and uh, uh, questions that uh, pertain to our practice setting in the ICU as well. And uh, for the next couple of minutes, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to address them uh, with you. Uh, from our audience poll, actually, uh, Pete, uh, you know, we have a question that says, in one hand, we are sending lab data and messages through text. Now systems use text to even page doctors. But on the other hand, we are recognizing that the use of messaging has gotten out of hand. Are we complaining about what we promoted to begin with? We. Healthcare providers are as guilty as other professions when we fixated on our computers. Uh, we went, you know, uh, we went from a phone call from the laboratory for an acute number that we would traditionally get. I've been practicing critical care for 30 years, that the lab would only call you. Now they send uh, an email with routine labs. We need to sit down with the lab person because. There's also been studies that if you look at your phone for worthless information, you're decreasing productivity and it's actually squandering millions of dollars of, of money. We also fill up our servers with this information. You know, I think the habit of uh, just getting a phone call or a, an acute test for a highly critical value is a safety thing, but getting uh, a, and the other thing is when we talk about texting, and I've stopped residents uh, in terms of texting, using your own personal phone for texting patient information may be opening up, Roy, a, a hornet's nest because many times, remember, people on, in the phone company did not take a HIPAA uh, oath. This is public data. Unless you have an internal system or an encrypted system, you should not be having patient sensitive information on your own personal phone. Just like uh, plastic surgeons should not be taking photographs on their iPhone that their child or neighbor can see. It should be in a encrypted, protected internal system. And hospitals need to invest in that. That's why I say you know, I, I, I prefer using a uh, secure device. Remember, our pagers were secure devices. They're only issued to hospital employees. Uh, and I'm using the, the, the beeper, which is, you know, an ancient device we all wear. But, uh, you know, the general public is not going to get your beeps with the you know, uh, with patient or text information. So I think you're mandated to have a protected system, encrypted system, with passport, uh, password protected system in terms of uh, your smartphone, if you're using the smartphone in lieu of a pager uh, to share information. Yeah, Peter, um, I want to combine some questions and then I have some other questions uh, that are coming in where I'd, I'd like to focus a little bit on uh, procedural, uh, you know, application. But, um, so some of the questions that are coming in now, uh, and uh, even uh, in my facility, we've dealt with this in, through steering committees, uh, is that these devices, uh, when you're going into an operating room or you're doing a bedside procedure, uh, where should these devices be? Should they be uh, held in a common area? Should a partner be holding on to these devices? Uh, Will you accept, because some outside advisory organizations actually say that 
a person may be able to respond uh, if a situation is emergent or urgent, but not for personal use. And as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, the strength of these policies, they vary or they're non-existent. So in, in your experience, in your organization, uh, with bedside procedures and in the operating room, um, how do you handle the use of devices? Uh, the, the, the uses are, uh, the devices I, are put aside. Good. Okay. Uh, they're put aside. There's someone obviously looking at the device, uh, the monitor, you know, in the operating room, while everybody else is doing the the timeout, and we do timeout at a bedside procedure in the in intensive care unit. People staring at their phones during a timeout is ridiculous because you're not paying attention. So we take the phone, the devices away, and there's somebody listening for that acute page. Let's say one of the trauma residents is doing a chest tube in my ICU. We take his beeper, but a nurse can quickly inform him that there's a level one coming to the op, uh, the, to the uh, ER in 10 minutes. You understand? Yeah. Instead of hit, you know, so we're, we we are we're using the rules that we we had in place for beepers for years. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Remember, we used to hand our beepers. You know, when you scrub to the OR, you handed your beepers to a central desk, right? Right. That rule worked for 50 years. Just because it's a smartphone, you, you understand? I understand. Same rules. Well, Peter, that could lead into the discussion on two other questions I'd like to talk about before we close this session. Uh, you know, about many of the position statements regarding noise and distraction. And they know, they understand that how heavily we rely on cellular devices. And they also note that interruptions interfere with auditory processing and can result in sentinel events. And being considerate of others is extremely important. You've emphasized that in your presentation. And the methods of handling emergent or urgent calls are just as important. But obviously, diversion of attention can lead to omissions and lapses. You can leave a guide wire in. You can leave an instrument in. Something bad can happen, as you demonstrated earlier in your presentation. And we hear the term sterile cockpit being used. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what is a sterile cockpit and how do the rules of the sterile cockpit apply to many things that we do which have high risk implications in our ICUs and in our OWAS. Right. As you know, the, the terminology sterile cop, uh, cockpit comes from uh, the aviation industry and the uh, Federal Aviation Organization where uh, during uh, going down checklists in the cockpit. There's no speaking other than the checklist. There's no noise. There's no radio. The, the cockpit door is closed. There is total focus on the task at hand. Uh, and that's a very, very important aspect uh, that you know, aviation safety is as good as, as it is in our country because of that. And we have taken that level of avia aviation safety and taken it to the operating room and when we perform procedures. That, you know, we review the checklist with each other and that's what we, we identify the patient. And all of this is being done in a protected cocoon, so to speak, that is not b being tempted by outside stimuli, loud music, TVs, you know, I, in the ICU, the patient's television, cut it off when you're doing a procedure, uh, and you can understand, to put the cell phones down, silence the phones, do whatever you need to do, so you have 100% focus at the, at the task at hand, because as you pointed out, things happen, uh, you know, and you don't want... Uh, you remove from your focus. Just like, as I pointed out, that resident who was going to write that order to stop the Coumadin got the flash, you know, had modified a hospital-issued smart tablet, okay, in another, in a major hospital in Boston, was getting the alert for the party, began texting about the party, then by the time she was done texting, had forgotten what she was supposed to do and did not write for that stop order on Coumadin. That's a violation of the sterile cockpit. That outside stimulus violated the sterile cockpit. You know, she, she had to go to another task and not the task at hand. Yes, exactly. Um, 
So we mentioned, Pete and Peter, that you uh, have spoken about many of the advisory organizations and professional organizations, and um, we see more and more of recommendations. Uh, and um, I mean, to what level uh, maybe is the Joint Commission going in this direction? I think there are comments out there in the Joint Commission as well. A lot of the Sentinel events, you know, are Sentinel events that are recorded because we have to give that information in order to capture that data. So we may not be actually capturing the appropriate data that actually shows what the extent of this problem is in our facilities as well. So uh, what is the direction? Well, I, I, I think uh, JACO is starting to look into this. JACO is definitely looking into the confidentiality issue and asking to look at people's uh, personal electronic devices to see if they've entered HIPAA protected information. Uh, they're observing people. Uh, I think, you know, uh, just uh, on, a, on the point of professionalism, public relations to the hospital, you know, if, if, if a patient is seeing all the staff wandering down the halls holding smartphones, they're going to get scared. They're going to think that that place is not professional. I think this smartphone fixation has definitely broken down professionalism, Roy. And I think outside agencies like the AORN, the American College of Surgeons, the American Society of Anesthesiologists have begun aggressively, aggressively uh, addressing this in their meetings, in their newsletters, in, I, I believe also the uh, professional organization of PAs has addressed this in an editorial. So we're trying to get that information out. And if lawyers are picking up, up on this as a part of the malpractice process that the individual was distracted and did not provide proper medical care, you know, it's going to be out there. This is this is something that's going out. And as I pointed out, the Canadian Society uh, actually has it in their code of, of ethics and standards for the Canadian uh, Respiratory Therapy Society as part of their professionalism. So I think across the board, uh, I think our professional organizations are looking into this. Today is an example of it. The Society of Critical Care Medicine is bringing this out in, in a, a webinar to address it in ICUs. Yep, that's true. So, so I, I think we're all, we all have figured out that it is a distractor. It is affecting our daily lives. And we as healthcare providers have to be at the cutting edge in terms of developing guidelines, protocols, and even, as I pointed out uh, at the end of my lecture, educating the public how dangerous this is. This has been terrific, Peter. I had a lot of fun interacting with you. And uh, as colleagues being able to present this to our audience, um, Peter, I, wa I want to thank you for your efforts preparing for and delivering this informative webcast. And thank you to our audience for your participation. Uh, please join us for our next free webcast in the series on January 12th. This concludes today's Project Dispatch webinar.